Love that. Thank you. That's a wonderful blessing. Love those songs, don't you? Way in a manger, thinking of Jesus born there. And then the joy that Jessica had on her face. I just, she was enjoying that. Beautiful. Thank you. I want to invite the church the family to turn to Psalms 66. Psalm 66, verse 16. Our scripture reading is found there today. Psalm 66, verse 16. Come and hear all you who fear God, and I will declare what he has done for my soul. Let's read that again. Come and hear all you who fear God, and I will declare what he has done for my soul. Isn't that a personal testimonies and how God works on our hearts is powerful, isn't it? And I ask that God blesses Dawn and Rhonda today as they share with us their story and how God has blessed them and how much he has done in their lives. May God bless you guys as you share today. Hi. <laughs> um, I was adopted at four and a half years old, and um, I was a really bad child. Uh, um, my, I went to school six months later. I mean, it was really fast, so I felt really stupid because I wasn't taught anything up until four and a half. And, uh, so one thing I did in second grade, I tried to change another child's um, assignment. I raised their name and <laughs> I switched the names, but of course I got caught. And then another time um, I got up and I did share and tell and I told them that there was no such thing as S-A-N-T-A. And um, many parents were upset with me and some children were crying. And so I don't know how my mother did it and my father. Um, they provided very well for me, but um, there was really no connection with my mom and I. And uh, I found out later in life, after my mom passed away, it was my dad that wanted a little girl. <laughs> and so that would have been easier to know years before, but I also had attachment disorder um, where, you know, you have a really hard time attaching to people. So anyway, then um, when I was about 11 in fifth grade, um, I wanted to kill myself. I hated school. If I could have quit, I would have because kids were really mean. And of course, I had not learned a lot of um, social skills up until four and a half. And uh, I thought school was for socializing and meeting boys. <laughs> That's all I cared about. I wanted to get married at a young age. And uh, then I had all my cousins and my brothers were all hippies. They were into drugs, alcohol, partying. And um, so I wanted to be accepted. And so by the time I was 15, I was um, partying and doing stuff that I shouldn't have been doing. Then by the time I was 17, I moved out. I lived on my own. I worked at McDonald's and Denny's. And uh, then I tried to commit suicide. And um, my mom <laughs> came to the hospital and she told everybody, well, she just wants attention. And it was a lot deeper than that. I had a lot of uh, emotional wounds and, um, you know, being pretty much thrown away from my parents. We were taken away for, for leaving us in the car when they would go to bars and drink. And there was generations of alcoholics. Um, so anyway, when I was about 18, well, back up, about 17, I met my knight in shining armor, my husband to this day, 36 years later. Um, nobody said we could last because I was 19 when I married him. He was like 27. And um, he was like nine and a half years older than me. Um, so anyway, uh, he saw me through rose-colored glasses. I don't know how he did it because I was a yeller like my mom. And, um, but I really, really had a dream. I wanted to be sweet. <laughs> I wanted to be good someday. But I didn't know how to. And so um, God... When I was like 10 years old, I told my mother, she took me to this church, Unity, and um, I wanted to get baptized, but I didn't want to get baptized the way they were saying. Somehow I knew it wasn't the way that you got baptized. And, um, but uh, it was a very different church. And um, but when I was 10 years old, I told my mom, I said, I need a prayer that I can pray to Jesus at night before I go to sleep. And I had dyslexia, so I had a really hard time learning uh, memorizing and reading, but I memorized that all on my own, and I prayed that prayer before I went to sleep every night, and uh, I, later in life, um, 
when I was, I met my husband and we were both heavy drinkers. Um, and uh, he lost his job and so when I was 21, I had to go in the army so that we could have an income. And pretty much um, him and I were alone in the world. Um, my parents could really care less at that time. You know, if I lived or died or was on the street, it didn't really matter. And uh, so I was in the army and <laughs> I prayed then more than I've ever prayed in my life because in the army, you have to excel. You can't just be average. And so um, to escape for the weekends, you had to excel in everything. So um, I prayed a lot and I did really good. <laughs> I was a good soldier, they said. And so, um, but it was very hard to be a, away from my knight in shining armor because other than my aunt, he was the first person in my life that ever loved me unconditionally. And so I told my captain that I needed to go home <laughs> because um, he had lost tons of weight and he was lonely and um, neither one of us really had any family. And my captain told me, I'm sorry, Private Anderson, but um, good soldiers we don't lay out. <laughs> and so I um, was in the reserves and I was in South Carolina and uh, wow, I was a minority it was very different, and I found out about blue laws. You couldn't buy alcohol after like um, midnight on Saturday night. It was very different, and uh, but I really always wanted to know God, um, even though I was a really bad person. And uh, but my husband always told me how wonderful I was, and that um, how much he loved me. And and another thing I wanted really bad with children and I prayed for 20 years and uh, I was a foster kid adopted and, and so my husband and I couldn't have children <laughs> and so um, finally um, when I was like 37 or so the neighbors down the street that also adopted little girls the same age as Katie Joy about and uh, their dog got out, so my husband and I had to help them because we knew they had toddlers at home that they, she couldn't go out and get the dogs. So we got the dogs and um, brought them back and she asked us if we'd wanna be uh, like babysitters and take care of their kids, but we'd have to go to classes. And my husband said, well, we're not adopting, okay, because he was scared to death to have children because he had had a lot of abusive um, uh, military dads. And uh, so I said, sure, honey. <laughs> so anyway, um, we had 12 children, foster care children, through the 10 years. And uh, when Katie Joy and Josiah came, um, she was 17 months old and he was uh, um, three. And for years when I, um, well, I forgot to tell you, I ended up going to the Nazarene church after I lost our baby. Um, when I was about 27, and I was furious at God for like three years, and then one night I stayed out on the couch, and I told my husband I had to talk to God, and so the next day, I told him we have to go to church, and I'd also told him in our drinking days that we were gonna get the blue Bible story books and the bedtime story books, and we were gonna teach our children out of that stuff, and we were gonna go to church with our children, <laughs> and we were gonna do all that stuff. And he said he didn't remember that, but um, so I did. I, I memorized scripture songs. I came into the Adventist church. Uh-oh, I need Kleenex. Um, oh, good. <laughs> anyway, um, we went to the Nazarene church for about a year, and, and I didn't want to be deceived. I wanted to know the truth. There were so many churches and I was really scared of being deceived because I was never academically gifted. But I knew the word of God was true. And when um, I was sitting in the church and I saw the scripture, one Lord, one baptism, one faith, one Lord, one baptism, and I said, okay, Lord, where is it? You know, there has to be one. And so um, then there was this really sweet lady that stood out among all the people at that church, all the women, 
and she was Swedish, and she always smiled and was sweet, and I wanted to be like that. And so I called her one Saturday, and I said, you know, could you, um, could you uh, go shopping with me today? I'd really like to get to know you. And she goes, oh, I'm so sorry. I don't shop on the Lord's Seventh-day Sabbath. I said, what? And what, what are you talking about? And she said, well, the command, you know, she tried to explain a little bit. I said, well, I really need to know. So I have to go to work early in the morning. Could you like put all your information out on your porch? Because I want to come pick it up before I go to work. And then I want to go home and study it. And I don't want to be deceived by anybody. So I have to study it by myself. And so she did. And so I got it the next morning. And I told my husband what I was doing. And he thought, oh, no. He knew one Seventh-day Adventist young man when he was a kid and he thought he was very nice and he liked him a lot, but he said he was very weird and um, <laughs> very different. So he didn't eat meat on his burgers and um, different things and so, and he was really good to his parents and my, my husband and I were both rebellious. But so anyway, um, 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 where was I? <laughs> um, so, okay, then I was studying and everything, and this really sweet lady, um, Hilda Nesbitt, had come over from Germany during the wartime, and she had gotten a great controversy, and she had a mission, and so my, this Swedish lady says, I can't teach her the Bible, you know, I can't speak that good English, so she gave, wanted to give me a Kenneth Cox video, and so I told her one wasn't enough, I needed the whole box, because we needed to watch them fast, because we didn't want to be deceived, but we wanted to watch them by ourselves. So my husband, myself, my neighbor, and um, his wife, we all drank and we all smoked, and not all of us, but um, we watched these videos every night, like four hours. And um, it's like, I knew it was true, I knew it. And uh, so um, we were going to the Vancouver church at that time, the old one, and we were really blessed by Pastor Ginger and his wife and the people. And um, so I was going to get baptized, and my husband still wasn't really going to church, but he sang a Steve Green song for me um, at my baptism. And I never really, um, I had a hard time with the concept of God really truly loving me because I knew he loved everybody else, but I was such a mess. And so, um, but. There was a baby lion at my baptism, and that was my absolute favorite animal. How many? Okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> so anyway, there was this baby lion at my baptism, and um, that never happens. And this lady just brought it in for the ch children's story, and it's like, wow. And um, so anyway, we went, we double dipped. We, finally, he started going with me. He would go to the church. He would sit outside while I was at church. The guys in the church would come out to his truck and visit with him while he smoked. And so he finally decided he might as well just come in the church. And um, so we were going there, and... Um, uh, it was amazing. And they, I learned about a Strong's Concordance. I'd never heard about those before. And I learned about scripture songs. And I knew that the Lord had power in his word. And um, I believed it with all my heart. Um, and I knew that was the only thing that could change me. So later in life, when we got to adopt the children, I had um, memorized these scriptures and I taught them. And um, like one ex ex example. I, Rhonda, drink and believe the word of God is life, power, and joy to my soul, based on John 7, 37 and 39. And I had ma major depression, I mean major. And um, the Lord did amazing things through his word, through scripture songs, and I thought I was learning all these scripture songs. I did want to be able to teach my children wherever I was, I could sing to them like, be ye kind, or um, hear instruction, Wherever we were, I wouldn't have to yell at them like my mom did. I could just sing to them, and, and I did still yell. But um, <laughs> but um, the Lord has helped me with that one. Um, but anyway, so um, we would be at people's house. I had two Christian friends because we had five foster children, and so I didn't have time for anything except that. And so I had two Christian friends that thought I was crazy because I was at their house, and like the children would like be unkind or something, and I would say, just a second, and I'd go, 
kids, we need to sing, and we'd kneel down, and we'd sing scripture song, and we'd choose to have a happy heart in Jesus, and um, they would, because they wanted to go play, and, um, but God did amazing things, and I, everybody thought I was crazy, my husband just like, wow, but he supported me in it, and my two Christian friends, they didn't want to do that, because it was too much trouble and too much work, and um, they just kind of thought I was crazy, and so, but later in life now, I have these wonderful, wonderful kids. Um, there's a scripture that says that um, your children can delight your soul and give rest to your soul, and that's exactly what I have. I don't have the strife in my home like I grew up with, and um, God has really watched over his word and performed it in their life. Like one time when Katie Joy was about three, she already knew the whole 10 commandment chapter in song, the whole love chapter, the Psalm 23. Um, that's how I, I taught them. Um, they didn't go to school until um, first grade uh, or so. But um, anyways, so I was grumpy, she was grumpy. She was helping me with mommy with her, my bed. And so I turned around and I said, Psalms 3.3, 3. and she said, God is my shield, my glory, and the lifter of my head. And um, the Lord blessed, and he helped us have happy hearts. I had to turn around because my face was grumpy, and I knew I wasn't supposed to be. And so <laughs> the Lord helped me to turn back around. Um, I really wanted to be a cheerful mom uh, because my mom was so depressed and so angry. Um, that that's one reason I was so much into the word. And I had a um, boss one time, he, I worked at a job um, after the kids were in school at first grade, and for three and a half years, they made it absolute hell. I mean, they didn't know I was an Adventist, they knew I was a Christian, but I didn't go out drinking with them or anything. I drank at home, but, um, yeah, but um, anyway, um, they hated me. I mean, they just hated me, and there was women that were higher up than me, and they just made my life miserable, and I snuck scripture songs the whole time. I wasn't allowed to listen to music, but I suck, s snuck scripture songs for seven years, Monday through Friday, singing, because I had an area that I worked in, so I would sing scripture songs, the ones that I memorized for my kids, for seven years, and I knew God would use them to change me, he did, and he kept that promise where he says that if um, we please him, that he will even make our enemies at peace with us. Even though I was still drinking at home, um, I don't know why, but he did. He blessed, and he knew what a mess I was, he knew how wounded I was, and um, he changed every single person, including the big top, manager over the whole assembly floor. Um, he wouldn't even acknowledge me when I said hi. These people, all of them were like that. They would look at their floor when you said hi or were cheerful, they didn't like it. And so I hated the job, but I knew that in my part that Jesus wanted us to represent him with a happy heart and that he had the power to make me that way. And so I finally had this one CEO of the company um, at, before I got to quit, because the Lord let me quit and retire to be with my kids. I, the Lord delivered me in May of 2015. I had been crying out for like a year before, and I had always had my little prayer in the morning, and, um, but I'd been crying out, Lord, I, I can't quit. I just can't. You need to deliver me. I really, I only have a couple years left with my children. They have to see the power of God in me. Um, and my husband, you know, I have to, and so my husband was traveling every other week, and he was gone this week, and the Lord let me know that it was then. So I stopped drinking, and um, the Lord delivered me completely. It was very, very hard. I went to work, and the Lord helped me be cheerful, and um, the Lord helped me at home, um, and it was just amazing. But I knew that there would be a blessing on the other side of, of me surrendering that. I self-medicated myself for years. And um, so in July, July 15, I got to retire from that job. And the big CEO, he asked me, he saw me and he smiled, oh, he, I don't know how much he smiled, but he actually said hi. And he said to me, do you always smile? I said, well, I learned that 
for uh, my children. I wanted to bless my children with a happy home, and so I practiced smiling all my life to um, give them an example that we could be happy. And uh, <laughs> he didn't say anything, he just, oh, and he walked away. But um, so it's so important, you know, the Lord, I mean, I have seen like this one Christian that really drew me, oh, and then Jan Douglas. <laughs> Did she ever draw me? I, I'm done. Okay. Um, <laughs> one thing, that's right. Um, at, when I went to the Adventist church, I went, got to go to my first woman's retreat, and Jan Douglas was there, and I didn't know her. And, but I went up to her, and I let her know I needed to meet her. <laughs> we started talking and sharing and stuff. She was so sweet, and um, she actually had went back into the world a little bit. She was raised Adventist, and, um, but she was so sweet, and I wanted to be like that, and uh, I was just so thankful. But people are always watching, and like one guy at work came up to me after he wouldn't speak to me, he wouldn't say hi to me or anything, and he came up to me years later and he said, Rhonda, you need to be at another place. You are too nice to be in a place like this. And um, so the Lord used me, even though I was still, you know, struggling with addiction um, at home, and I was so ashamed if somebody would come to the door, I would put it down, it was a beer usually, I would put the can down behind the table because I didn't want anyone to know. Um, and so, but um, God is so faithful and he loves us so much. And, you know, I've heard people say that, um, you know, I mean, we need prayer. <laughs> and I know that there are people, I found out there was a natural Lutheran great praying grandma that I had because I had a hunger for God. I wanted to be good and I wanted to be kind. And um, I just am so thankful that she prayed for us. I got to meet her when I was 18. And, uh, you know, it's so important. I mean, I drive down the road, even as with the children, um, we'd be driving and like one time our car was breaking down and my husband's out of town. And I'd say, sing kids. Praise the Lord, hallelujah. Um, I wasn't Adventist yet, but, um, <laughs> but no, I was, but um, I had learned these songs and I forgot to tell you, after I lost the baby and I had to go to work a couple months later, I would cry all the way to work, but I'd be singing that song and I would tell the Lord, I have to have your help, you have to help me, because otherwise I can't get through the day. And um, so we really sang. So one time the car is breaking down. It's making these noises. I have no family down here in this area. I'd not go to church at the time. And so the kids, all the foster kids started singing with me. We sang all the way from Vancouver to Woodland and got home safe. I never broke down on the road. That was such a praise of the Lord. But we sang all the time. And the children were never allowed to be ashamed of the word of God. Um, as very little, I taught them, if mommy asks you to sing a scripture song, you must sing because it's choosing God. And um, one time when the, a couple years ago, they were being grumpy to each other. And so <laughs> um, I told them, okay, kids, you sit at that end, you sit at that end, don't look at each other, we're gonna sing. And my son especially was not happy. And um, so we started singing um, uh, the love one. I sure wish you'd sing it. No, love is patient, love is kind. Yeah, that one. Yeah, started singing it and everything. Within five minutes, the Lord had changed all of our hearts. I was just praise the Lord. So anyway, um, God is awesome. His word is so powerful. And I thank God that he helped me be a weirdo all those years. And I was not accepted until I came to this church because I had known Christians before, I had known Adventists, but they still thought I was a little off because I always wanted to push scripture songs. And um, I came to this church and you guys love me. And um, Audrey, she would say, no, it's okay, you're chatty. We still love you. <laughs> and I would go to prayer meeting and then I got to go to Sunday morning prayer at her house and Pam loved me and Audrey and Carol, I'm mean, not Carol, Cheryl, and I mean, and I just, I was so accepted here and so loved and it's great because we don't have any other family alive. You know, I mean, they're not, they don't like us, you know. So anyway. All right. uh.
Rhonda, you didn't have to finish that quick if you didn't want to. You could have took a little more time. <laughs> anyway, my name is Don. I've been here ooh, a little over a year now. And uh, starting off, I grew up in Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh. And uh, I guess you would say I grew up in a Presbyterian religion, church, and my mother was a Sunday school teacher, my father was a deacon. And uh, you joined the church when you were 12, and, but unfortunately, when you turned 16, it was up to us if we wanted to go to church or not, and I decided not to go to church anymore. But uh, God's been keeping an eye on me for a long time. It started when I was very young. At about the age of seven or eight, I was a big cowboy fan, so I was watching cowboys all the time. And uh, we had a big basement. And one day I just happened to go down to the basement with a rope, tied it to a beam, got on a chair, put it around my neck. I was going to hang myself because I saw it on TV. And as I was jumping off the chair, my cousin came down the steps and stopped it. So that's the first time God saved me. And uh, you'd think I'd learn, but I'm a very hard learner. Uh, it takes me a long time to learn anything. And uh, it, growing up, I... Never saw my parents argue, never heard them argue once. Never heard them raise their voice, but I also never saw them show affection with each other. So that was kind of hard, not really knowing what love was growing up. And uh, in high school, I, I was your average student, but my, my brothers were always the smart ones. They were always honor roll students and president of their senior classes, and my parents wanted me to be like them, and they, the more they pushed me to be like them, the more I, I went the other way. But uh, at the end, I showed them I could get my, my, my um, boy, blank time. Hmm? 4.0. Yeah, my, my, well, not 4.0, but <laughs> I could get my scholarships. But I, I asked them to sign me. I, my last three months of high school, I went to the recruiter. And I was going to join the Air Force, but he was busy, and the Marine Corps was across the hall, so next thing I know, I'm signing up for the Marine Corps. But uh, the day after I graduated, I went to boot camp. That was in June of 1968. December 7th, 1968, I landed in Vietnam. So at that time, I was all gung-ho, was going to go in the war myself, because I had a couple of friends that graduated before I did that were killed over there. But uh, the day I got there, I was at, they sent us to like a little staging area in Da Nang for waiting for orders, and another flight came in. And as that flight landed and the ramp came up, five rockets hit it, so I was being rained, body parts were being rained on me after 15 minutes being there. And I was ready to go home then, but that doesn't work that way. But, uh, and, and for the longest, up till about a year and a half ago, the biggest word in my vocabulary was luck. This was luck, that was luck. And it wasn't until, I guess, God showed me that there's no such word as luck. And uh, it was my parents and my church praying for me the whole time I was there. They got me through the things that pulled me through. I mean, Christmas, uh, I'll just do a few of them because this is usually a hard time for me anyway. But talking about it eases the pain. But on Christmas of 1968, we were on our first operation and uh, it was supposed to have been a truce at the time. But uh, they let the lieutenant had my squad do a little patrol around the hill we were on. And my squad decided to let me walk point for the first time as a Christmas present, which is the first guy out. So my fire team and I were, I was in the point fire team, first fire team out, first four guys. And I was in front of those guys. And lucky me, I found, here I go with that word again, lucky. Unfortunately, I find footprints in the mud because it had been raining and uh, I turned this little trail and it's like a, a little valley with the hills going straight up and it just soaking wet from mud and there's big boulders and there's maybe 25 30 feet down there's a turn in the road so I'm watching where I'm going as I look up a Viet Cong comes around the corner and for some reason they wanted us to walk with our weapons on safety so I flipped my M16 and it misfired I ejected it before I could Finish that, he started firing at us. So it was like, I guess, what you might say, if, you, if you've seen old war movies where the bullets are pouncing right by your feet, inches away, and I'm dodging and diving, 
And I guess when he's done firing, he runs back around that, that corner, and I get up, and I'm going, wow, it was a close one, guys. And I look back, they're all dead. And for the longest time, I thought I should die, not them. So I suffered from a lot of survival guilt. But God, I can say God has plans. But like I said, I didn't think about God the whole time I was there. It was my, my, my mother and my father, my church. So prayers do work. They work more, more than we know. But uh, once, once I got out of the military, I was really messed up in the head. I, I didn't see the change in me, but uh, people that knew me said, you're not the same anymore. I said, I don't, I don't see any difference in me. But uh, there was a lot of anger. I had no feeling in me, no feeling at all. I couldn't feel pain. I couldn't feel hurt. You know, if somebody came to me hurting, I couldn't. I, didn't, I, I, I struggle with that to this day. And... Uh, but, uh, I mean, when I got out, I got into the drug scene big time. Drugs and other things that are not even appropriate to talk about. And the drugs lasted for a long, long time. Because the, the uh, VA had me on a lot of medication, too. And to me, they weren't working. All they did was make me a zombie. I couldn't function for 20 hours out of the day. I felt good for a few hours, and then I'm taking pills again. But um, I remember one time when I was living in Arizona, I had taken my medication from the VA and got upset because it wasn't working. So I go out and start finding all the street drugs I can find. And, and I, get to, I walk in this little novelty shop and I see this little pistol crossbow. It's got like a 30 pound pull to it. I say, oh, let's go get that. So I buy that and I go back to my motel room and I'm just getting more and more depressed and thinking, just saying, God, why am I still here? I shouldn't be here. I shouldn't have came back. To me, there's this word lucky again. The lucky ones were the ones that came back in body bags because they didn't have to live with it. They, weren't, they didn't come back and they were called baby killers and spit on and stuff like that. And uh, so after I got as loaded as I could get, I laid down on that bed, took my glasses off, pointed that pistol that arrow right at my eye, inches away. And I remember pulling that trigger and falling out, passing out. And I woke up the next morning. Had I not gone into the military, that thing wouldn't have been on safety. But it was on safety, so it didn't fire. But uh, it's, like I said, it's only been a year and a half. And what brought me up here was I was on the computer, you know, as I say, looking for love in all the wrong places, and that's what I was doing. And I had never, you know, I, I started texting with somebody that lived in Battleground. And I'd never really, I'd done it for a long time, but I never really wanted to go anywhere, you know. But something just had me, pulled me up here, and God pulled me up here. And when we met, we found out we were the two most opposite people in the world. But she had found, she had fallen in love with God years ago, and I hadn't. But uh, we started falling in love with God together. We still have a long way to go, but what brought me to this church was where she lived at, Roberta lived at. And her and Roberta would do Bible studies together, and I started joining them with their Bible studies. And uh, Roberta started talking about this church, and here I am. But, uh, which is, which is, I like, I like it a lot. But the one thing that I would like to see more of here is, is a, I don't hear about it, about going out and, and witnessing the people. I went to a church a couple of weeks ago. It was the Seventh-day Adventist church. And they were talking about, because I guess a lot of you guys know how to do it, but I struggle with it. And the few times I've gone out to try to witness in somebody, I was witness to you know, and, which was good, too, but so <laughs> God has his ways of working things out. But uh, I would like to, because they have a program where they, they teach people how to witness twice a month. And I would love to have something like that at this church. 
And even the ones that do witness, other ones have ideas that would help them, and they would have ideas that would help the other ones. So I'm praying that we can get something like that going. But uh, let's see. Boy, you should have went longer, Rhonda. <laughs> uh, let's, see, let's go back into my life again. I mean, when I've got four kids. My oldest daughter had it rough because her and her, her and her mother, me and her mother were divorced back when she was about four years old. But she stayed in my life. And then I got remarried and had another daughter and two sons. And uh, I don't have a close relationship with any of them, even though I am trying to now. But my oldest daughter, she, I need her prayers from you guys for her. She's been on the streets in California for probably going on 15 years now in the meth and heroin. And, and uh, I haven't heard from her in quite a few years. And the thing is that shows you how good God is. Her daughter, my granddaughter, her father, her mother is a junkie living on the streets. Her father is in prison for murder. And she's got a scholarship to college. So, and I haven't heard from her in a while. I, I haven't heard from any of my kids. And, but my ones in Tucson, I have uh, three granddaughters down there and two grandsons that I haven't that had a chance to meet. We left on, on bad terms, but I'm trying to reach out to them through Facebook. And it's a struggle, but I'm not going to give up because I know God's not going to give up. And, uh, but I do appreciate your prayers for my oldest daughter, though. And let's uh, see. Like I said, I've got a long, long way to go, but, and not much time to get there, but I'm believing that God's going to get me there, going to get us all there. So let's see. Hmm. Rhonda, you should have went five more minutes. <laughs> mm, let's see. Uh, it's only when you go too long. That yeah, that's it. <laughs> I'll probably think of something to say in five minutes. But uh, no. Uh, I just i am thankful that God brought me to this church. That... We've got to remember that even though we want to think we're there, we're not there. Yeah. We've always got somewhere else to go. And to, how important it is to be in the Word every day. I mean, the things I'm saying, I struggle with. I struggle with being in the Word every day. I struggle with praying. You know, me, to me, a good prayer is, oh, a couple of minutes and I'm done. But... Uh, I know that without falling in love with Jesus, there's no hope. That's right. God is faithful. Yeah. He doesn't give up. Oh, no. He hasn't, he hasn't given up on me. Okay. I think I'm close enough. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So if we can turn to page 338 in our hymnals. We love you, Don. Thanks. We love you too, Rhonda. Thanks. Thank you both for sharing your testimonies with us today. What a blessing. Please stand as we sing page 338, so true, redeemed, we're all redeemed, thank goodness. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, redeemed through His infinite mercy, His child and forever.
Redeemer, I think of him all the day long. I sing for I cannot be silent. His love is the beam of my song. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed. Thank you so much for the privilege of being in your house today. Amen. We have felt your Holy Spirit here, Lord. And we thank you that there is no luck, but it's your providence, your care that brought both Don and Rhonda through and brought them here to our Whipple Creek Church. We're so thankful for each one of them for the blessing they are to our church family. And we pray that you will continue to be with them as they grow in their walk with you. And I pray for each one of us that we too will day by day keep looking to Jesus to become more like him. And I pray that we too will have radiant faces with smiles on them because we belong to you that other people will see that we have been with Jesus. Bless us as we continue our fellowship today. And I pray that each one here will be in your kingdom by your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated.